now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post Podcast. We have arrived at the all-star break of the NBA season. And one of the big stories in the league right now is that two of the league's old Lions left for dead dynastic and or marquee franchises have reinvented themselves in this beautiful sort of slow, organic process of self-discovery. The Los Angeles Lakers are 8-3 and three in their last 11 games. The Golden State Warriors are 8-4 and four in their last 12 games. And you can hear the head honchos at ESPN and ABC. <laughs> are they going to be contenders? Can they be contenders? Can we have long playoff runs? But before we get to that conversation, the head honchos at ESPN and ABC did backflips and cartwheels because Adrian Wojnarowski <laughs> and our other guests today, Ramona Momo Shelburne, dropped a neutron bomb on the NBA world this week by reporting that the Golden State Warriors cloak and dagger under the cover of Nightfall tried to trade for LeBron freaking James at the trade deadline in a deal that would have been partly brokered by Draymond Green, who has an incredible talent for being at the center of literally everything that happens (laughs) in the NBA, at least by his own telling of it, that would have paired Stephen Curry and LeBron James, two of the defining stars, if not the two defining stars of the last 25 years. It did not happen. I have a million questions, and luckily I have Ramona Shelburne here. How are you? I'm good, Zach. We got to use the word clandestine in the lead. Did you See, like that? I say clandestine. Is that okay. is that wrong? I think you can go either way. I think it's clandestine or clandestine. Well, we have set the low post land speed record for most quick quickest turn into grammatical minutia in the history <laughs> of this podcast, which is a hard record to set. So, okay. I'm, I just want to start with the yeah. basics. So this story, we're, we're recording this on Thursday afternoon. This story published... Wednesday morning? Yesterday Wednesday morning? morning, yeah. When did you hear about this? How did you hear about this okay. without naming names or divulging? Yeah. I know you got to be careful. You want a, you when, want a little scene setting? You want a little when, scene just setting? when and how okay. and what is the reaction of some of the main higher ups involved when you and Woj begin to alert them that this is a thing that is in the works? Um, I was, it was, okay. So it was last Thursday night, last Thursday was the trade deadline. Um, and you and I were on that show. We did the, there was like oh, a few trades. There was 39 players that moved. So, you know, a fair amount of player movement, but no huge names, no, no James Harden trade at the deadline or Kevin Durant. Um, and then it was the Kobe Bryant statue unveiling here in Los Angeles. And then the Lakers were hosting the Nuggets. So this was a very long Thursday. I got to about halftime of the Lakers Nuggets game and I had to go back to the office across the street to go get my stuff because at the Kobe statue unveiling, we were not allowed to bring our our bags, our purse, anything like that. You could just bring like your cell phone and a wallet. So I was like, let me go get my stuff from the office now so that I can just leave after the game. I'll, I'll go at halftime. Not two steps out of the arena, I get a call from Woj and he's like, are you alone? (laughs) <laughs> That's a great way to start a phone call, by the way, in any alone? context. In any context. <laughs> like, in other words, can anyone hear you? Because what I'm about to say is going to floor you. And they had, all, you know, when you go to uh, crypto.com arena and there is the, the scaffolding lost, up. If this were around the horn, you just lost five I points know. for calling it crypto.com arena. I know, I it's the Staples button, Center. Minus arena. five. I agreed. Um it, there's like scaffolding all around when they have big events and you and you have to take like the longest route possible to get back across the office. Like there's no good way to go there. And Woj starts telling me that he heard about this and he goes, we got we to gotta try to report this. And I got so lost because I could, my jaw was on the ground. And I'm also very nervous that anyone is hearing me talking as I'm walking around outside of, outside of Staples Center. And the scaffolding is up. I can't get through to Figaro. I had to go all the way back around through the parking garage. I'm like completely disoriented because this trade is making my mind explode, right? You're there's, starting there's... to sound like the Californians. I had to take the 110 to the <laughs> 10 to the... <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, have you ever been here when there's events? Like there's scaffolding yes. everywhere. And you have to walk all the way through that parking garage. And it's all... Anyway, I was so disoriented and the, the my head's going to explode. And then we're like... Th- this was real. Like this was not just an, a one phone call where Daryl Morey calls Rob Palenka and he goes, hey, would you guys think about trading LeBron? And then Palenka says, well, would you trade Embiid? Right? It wasn't like 
that due diligence kind of phone call. This was a real... Which, to be clear to listeners who may not have yeah. read your story, is a real conversation that yeah, happened that between really Daryl Morey and Rob Polinka. And I would really have loved <laughs> to have heard the conversation. If I were Rob Polinka, I would have strung him along. I wouldn't have gone right for the sarcastic yeah. and beat retort. I yeah. would have been like, well, well, let's see. What do you got? Can I have DeAnthony Melton <laughs> or first round? Anyway, go ahead. Um, and, you know, of course, Daryl Morey also called Phoenix for Kevin Durant. Like, cause, cause why not? Right. You make 99 phone calls. Maybe somebody says yes. You never know. Like, love. Yeah. You know? A few, anyway. a few beers in, a yeah. few beers in, Matt Ishbia. I, I feel you like that what? must, be- yeah. you know what? We're not that good. We're 31 and 22. <laughs> Maybe it's not working. <laughs> what do you got? Maybe Embiid? No? Okay. Um, the uh so so most of those phone calls, like like I you know these these calls happen in the NBA, right? People call to check on star players, they're sort of laughed out of the room or they're quickly rebuffed. It happens all the time. When the Bucks traded for Damian Lillard, they told me a nice story about how John Horse used to call Portland and say like, Hey, we'd really love to talk about, about Dame if you're ever interested. And they called for years. And then finally one day they were interested. So like, there's a reason to call. This was not that this was more. And um, when we first heard about this, it sounded like very, a, a little more serious than it probably was. Right. Like I think a lot of, because of the names and this stage and the, the, the names involved, right. This is LeBron James and Steph Curry and, Two kids from Akron, if you want to go in that direction, right? The de- defining players of their era, um, potentially on the same team. Like, oh my goodness. And the fact that it was even more than a quick phone call and dismissed dismissive thing between GMs is is a story. And so Woj, Woj and I start working on it last Thursday night after the trade deadline. Everyone we called um to check on it, I think their first reaction was, How the hell do you hear about this? How the hell you even get wind of it because like we use the word clandestine in the story but it was another person said top secret like this was never ever supposed to get out i think this was sort of like the you know i don't i don't know how Woj Woj knows things like i think he has yeah i so so in true in true me fashion i had the the next day i was like well now i'm gonna call these people and like follow up with like what's going on so i'm a day behind just curious more curious than anything else and everyone I got on the phone had this air of like, oh, God, you're calling about that. We didn't want that to get out. Oh, geez. <laughs> and, I, you know, we had some like debate about like how like, OK, it didn't go anywhere. There were never names exchanged. Right. It never got to that level where they said, OK, Kaminga and four first or it never got to anything like that. But it's the Warriors calling the Lakers about LeBron. And it was more than just Palinka real quickly rebuffing the other GM. This got to be owner to owner conversations. And all right, so let me let me it, be let me be clear of the chain of events so that yeah. people so I under okay. just to make sure I okay. understand it correctly, and then mm-hmm. you can explain why and this Paul chain did of some events. explaining of that himself with Stephen A. Smith yesterday. We'll, we'll get to that. I listened to that in the car today. Um from from I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. Here's how the conversation mm-hmm. seems to have unfolded, according to you and Woj. Joe Lacob, the governor of the Warriors, hashtag light years, calls Jeannie Buss, the governor of the Lakers, and is like, hey, LeBron made his semi-annual unhappy emoji thing. Like, is there something that could happen? Because we, mm-hmm. we'd like to get in on that. What do we have to trade? Let's set that aside uh, until later. Again, if I'm reading your story correctly, yeah. Jeannie Buss tells Joe Lacob, well, hey, you got to talk to Rich Paul and LeBron's people um, to, to gauge their level of interest. Like that's that's a LeBron thing. Like we want our stars on this team to be happy. You you check it out. And so right there, if I'm reading you correctly, there was one more hot... part. Okay, oh, yeah. so I'll interrupt the, the, my my understanding of how that these first conversations started. There was a little more prologue to it. It's not like Joe just picks up the just phone. called out of the blue. Yeah, right. I think this was a discussion amongst the Warriors. I think Draymond Green was in on these early discussions. I've heard other Silicon Valley billionaires in on these discussions who are season ticket holders, often seen at Warriors games, know all the players involved. Um, so that, that's also, just, that's, that's I know, tremendous. That's I, know. Tremendous. I was not looped in companies. on it. They didn't yeah. loop me in on any of the conversations. Uh, yeah. So I think this was a sort of, everyone has been watching LeBron's behavior over the past week and a half, two weeks leading into the trade deadline. 
um, and wondering what that really means. And so Draymond Green, close personal friend of LeBron James, is in on these early, like, hey, let's let's do this. Let's make a run of LeBron. Okay. Um, I think there was a lot of there was there was a concerted effort. I would call it a multi-tiered effort here from the Warriors. This wasn't just like, hey, Mike, make a call to Rob, see if they want to do anything. This was a player level, GM level, ownership level. And the Lakers took the calls and, and you know, Rob Polinka basically said, no, we're not interested in trading him. And Jeannie Buss said, well, we want him to be a Laker. We're not interested in trading him. But if the question is, does LeBron want to be a warrior? Would, would LeBron want to be a warrior? Would he be interested? Only LeBron can answer that, right? And the Lakers are, I don't know if there's any franchise or ownership group that is better at taking care of superstars than Lakers. They're, it's literally their brand. I mean, there's an entire plaza of statues out in front of superstars that have played well enough for the Los Angeles Lakers that they have statues out front and jerseys retired and they celebrate their hero. Maybe the Celtics, maybe the Celtics have that, that have that, that level of, of superstardom um, with their franchise. But like, this is what the Lakers do. They want them to be happy. And so I think that even though they had no interest in trading LeBron, the question is, well, I mean, if you want to know if LeBron would be interested in the war, you got to ask LeBron's agent. And that's an opening door. I mean, it's not a hard no, right? It's, that's well, a- that's what I wanted to clarify. Because I, I honestly, I, I read the story so furiously the first time I read it. Yeah. Like, not furiously, like angry. Did angrily, you think we got like, hacked, by the way, when you first saw the tweet? No, no, no. I just read it <laughs> in a frenzy. And then I reread it, and I, and I, and I landed on the story. In the end, the answer was returned resoundingly on the eve of the trade deadline. Paul, Rich Paul, told Lacob and Warriors GM Mike Dunleavy Jr. that James had no interest in a trade and wanted to remain a Laker, sources said. Paul told Lacob. That means LeBron's agent, Mm -hmm. the CEO of Clutch Sports, Rich Paul, had a conversation with the owner of the Warriors and the general manager of the Warriors about LeBron James. That by itself is a highly unusual thing that suggests that unofficially or officially, likely unofficially, I think of our meeting between the lines, the Lakers said, yeah, you can talk to you can talk to our guy, basically, which is like a thing that doesn't happen at this yeah. level. And there's a lot of this is the clarity that that we had to get in reporting this. OK, um, the, the, the concept of permission. Right. Do you have permission? Well, permission to negotiate with another player's agent or whatever it is. Um, that is usually an email from one GM to another. Right. Do you have permission? It's something a little more official. This was much more. Well, I don't know if he wants to be a warrior. You, you have to ask Rich, right? Like th- that's a sort of how owners talk and how people do business. I don't think that was officially granting per- to permission to negotiate a trade, but it's sort of like a you could take his temperature. Now, it should also be pointed out here that Rich Paul represents two players on the Warriors, Moses Moody and Draymond Green. So there's plenty of reason for Rich Paul to be talking to the Warriors anyway. Um, it And I think... The reason why I found this story very interesting is that all of this took time. Like this wasn't immediate answers. Like some of it is getting an answer from LeBron. Some of it is Rich and LeBron have to talk. Some of it is Rich has to talk to everybody else. But this took place over about a 24 hour period. This is all day Wednesday. It starts like kind of Tuesday night ish, I think, where the Warriors formulate a plan to start doing this. Then Wednesday is mostly when this is. When this is out in the air, so, so the Utah trade deadline trading, is Thursday you, at noon Pacific. Utah trading Simone Fontecchio to Detroit was not the biggest NBA thing occurring <laughs> on the Wednesday of trade deadline week. No, and like in the meet at the same time, the Warriors are also trying to get Kelly Olynyk, and they're trying to get Alex Caruso, and they're making they're fielding calls on Andrew Wiggins, and ultimately deciding to keep him because they've been playing well of late. And so there's a lot of other things that are happening in the foreground, and then there's this super secret Titanic thing that is happening in the background that only a few people know about now were they using were they using cyber dust to communicate <laughs> should have been <laughs> hashtag the dust i mean uh, you, does this you, does cyber dust still exist oh yeah my i uh, that's how you have to talk to mark cuban right if you want to talk no, to cuban true. you have to use cyber dust right um they uh i think it's um you know th- in the realm of trades that didn't happen in the nba very rarely you hear about trades that could have happened or would have happened. Like 
what's the most infamous one? Like the the Lakers were going to trade James Worthy for Mark Aguirre. One one one. Well, way there, back there's a the lot. Day. There's a lot a million of Ben's Woods. A couple of them involve Scottie Pippen. You know, yeah. there's 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 there, there are a lot of sliding doors. Like, hey, we got to the goal line on this one, and maybe yeah. it didn't happen. And I don't think this was ever to the point where it's like a goal line where there's re- somebody just had to say yes or anything like that. there was never names involved because there's no there's no reason to put names in until you know if lebron is amenable to this idea but what i think is most fascinating is like he had an out like there's your out if he wanted if he was really unhappy with the lakers and he wanted to go someplace else and you know if the hourglass meant time up right we we had a radio producer who did a deep dive on the hourglass emoji and apparently on the iphone predictive text when you do hourglass there's one emoji where the sand is in the top of the hourglass and there's another emoji oh where the sand God. is in the bottom i mean this my my producer greg is going to love that i pointed this out cuz he was very proud of himself for looking this up and the one lebron uses where the, the sand is at the bottom of the hourglass Okay, words, I mean, so not times so, running out, times up. So I'm, I'm just out on the whole like <laughs> this annual. Hey, what did I do? I didn't do anything. Just, yeah. just a tweet. I don't want to answer any questions about yeah. it. I'm out. I'm out on the whole thing. I'm out yeah. on the like. I'm gonna pout for a month in Cleveland until you trade the whole thing. Just come out and say what or just you. I don't know. I'm just. I just. I, I don't like it. It's. It's not. Um. But you're. You're about the out. The out was there. You're correct. So that's this is what's interesting to me is that so everything I've heard for five years, because that's how long it's been since LeBron has yeah. been on the Lakers now. Everything I've heard, and there's been remember when All Star was in Cleveland, there was this all of this like, would LeBron ever go back to Cleveland stuff? And then there was this whole like, well, would the Cavs even want LeBron? No, I'm like, yes, they would. Yeah. Um, for five years, all I've heard is LeBron wants to finish his career as a Laker. Not mm-hmm. just in Los Angeles, as a Laker. If he has his druthers, he would finish his career as a Laker. There's the Bronny James variable. I don't know enough about that world to really get into it. Mm-hmm. But I, that's all. Have you heard this? And Rich, Rich, yeah, Paul I've heard the same. And Rich has this affirmed publicly. the same. Yeah, so, Rich has so affirmed the same. That that um, that does not mean that there isn't some breaking point at which the Lakers fall so far out of the universe of contention. That he does not, I, I don't know that that's absolute. In other words, like if Anthony Davis breaks his leg or get grows not discontented wood, and asks for a trade or everything goes sideways and the team is like 15 and 30 and just so far away, then I, you know, would he look around? I have no idea. Like, I don't know that that thing is absolute, but right. in the last four seasons, they've won a title and gotten to the conference finals. They're starting to play better right now. And it was fascinating to me. To hear Rich Paul say publicly to Stephen A. Smith stuff that I've heard from people in the LeBron orbit privately in the last year, two years, like it, it, people should listen to the Rich Paul interview with Stephen mm-hmm. A. Smith because it was very illuminating. He knows LeBron better than anyone. And he said, like, we he uses we to talk about yeah. clutch and LeBron. Yeah. Like, LeBron is I, I'm paraphrasing. I want people to listen to it. But you and please rein me in if you think I'm misinterpreting. It's kind of like. We're not chasing ring number five and ring number six. Like everyone thinks LeBron is chasing ring number five and ring number six. Like he's won everything there is to win. He wants to be happy and enjoy the process and enjoy the locker room. And he even talked about like, say we switch teams. Like say we go to Golden State. LeBron goes to Golden State. And he doesn't like he said the phrase he uses like, what's the win? What's the win there? If if we if we if the the lake if that team falls short. All the scrutiny is going to be on LeBron for switching teams and falling short again. He, he, Rich talked in that interview publicly, like anyone who thinks LeBron is sitting there chasing that ghost every night, ruminating on Kobe's got five, Michael's got six, I've got four. Mm -hmm. That's not apparently LeBron's mindset. That's what I've heard privately for, for a long time now. Um, that, and I, and this is what I said earlier this week. I think that 2020 title changed. Everything is different if they don't have that 2020 title. Mm -hmm. He came to LA. He won a title. He won a title with a third franchise. He stamped his place in Lakers history for whatever you think of it. And if they lose in the conference finals that year or lose in the finals, I I do think this feels differently. But I I, tell me what you've heard in, in, in relation to all of this and what your reaction to Rich's appearance on the Stephen A. Smith YouTube show was. So I will I will say I, I understand your reading of or your interpretation of what Rich said. 
I heard it a little differently. I heard it as more of his advice to LeBron rather yeah, than w, the, Rich is not LeBron. They're separate people. Yeah. But I think he was saying my advice to him is like, this is how you should think about things. You can't win every year. Like you have to be enjoy everything. Soak it up. And he said, LeBron still has that fire. I think I remember him saying that in the Stephen A interview yesterday. Um, he still loves basketball. He still wants to do this, but look, Zach, you and I have covered all time greats towards the end of their careers and everyone approaches them differently, right? There was Dirk Nowitzki who was just going to ride out to the sunset with the Mavs. He was just Mavericks. So there was never a question about that. Kobe, I think there was some discussion at some point um, of whether or not he wanted to endure the, the youth movement that they had clearly gone in. I remember very distinctly getting calls from Rob Polinka, who was then his agent at the time, saying like, the Lakers need to go get Dwayne Wade. They need to get Kobe another star. He th- his last years should not be like this. Like he was advocating for them to go get more players, right? So- soft as Charmin. Remember soft as Charmin. Soft as Charmin, right? Poor Jeremy Lin. Why do we have to bring? It was it Jeremy Lin, right? When he was on. Was, I don't remember exactly <laughs> who. <laughs> but they, uh, the, you know, the, the Kobe's last years in Los Angeles were on terrible teams. I mean, those teams were lottery teams every single year. And like even that last season that Kobe, we all remember the 60 point game because it was so iconic and so amazing. But the rest of that year sucked. That's why I'm saying I think in my gut there is a breaking point where the Lakers fall below level X. This becomes a different discussion. Championship in 2020 conference finals Mm -hmm. last year. TBD this season, we'll talk about it. They're over that threshold. And this summer, you know, they're going to have three first round picks. Yeah. They're going to try to go for a game changing perimeter talent. We don't need to name all the names and stay over that threshold. But I think yeah, that's I think the they point. Will. I think that's the point you're making is yeah. It it I don't know what the right word is, but it's it's there is a point at which the losing the losing would eat at him and does it's, eat at him. Yeah, it eats at him. It also like you have, every time I see LeBron, I am staggered by how good he still is at age 39 and how much work goes into being that good at age 39. Like we've seen like Kobe in his last couple of years was not the Kobe that we all knew. Like he was not himself. He was not as good of a player. He lost a step. Like same thing with Dirk. Like they were they were out there for whatever they could do. But like it was clear to them and to everyone else, like their best days were behind. LeBron's still freaking good. Like, he's still really good. He should be an all-NBA player if he plays enough games. Um, and I think, you know, he's he's the captain of the all-star team, and he gets the leading vote. It's not – this is not a popularity contest. He still puts in the work to be as physically dominant as he is. And so where is that motivation coming from? Is that – like, I don't – I mean, I work hard at my job. You work hard at your job. But, like, to I don't know how – I don't know how it feels to get up at 5 in the morning every single day to train, and it gets harder and harder to be – at the level he is, right? There's a certain thing with our job where it's not about the physical preparation anymore for you. <laughs> like we have to just watch the games and make our calls and stay in touch and whatever. I, I don't know how the guy does speak it. For, speak I, for yourself. I'm in that cold tub every night, Ramona. I'm getting up. I'm hitting the way. I'm hitting the You know what? I'm going morning. to cryo these days, Zach. I'm going to, I'm getting some B12 shots every once in a while. You know, you're right. We're in our 40s. I got I a can't... cold tub right over here, just off camera. I hop in every night after the late games. After, the, right pa- after the late games, <laughs> get ready to watch again. Um, but, but like I, the that motivation is not just to keep playing, to work that hard. It's not to collect a paycheck. It's not because he's bored in, and doesn't want to retire. It's because he still wants to win. There's no way you work that hard. And don't have that fire. And the reason why he he even hinted at retirement last year when he lost to Denver is because it hurt that bad to lose. And so I think that I don't think the Lakers are that are going to fall off a cliff. I think they're pretty well positioned actually going forward with AD locked up on that extension. LeBron has a player option, but I expect he will be back with the Lakers. And I do think they go pursue a third star this summer because of the picks you mentioned and the contracts they have. Um, But he is not a forever Laker like these other Lakers we are talking about. I I think they will retire his number eventually if you'll if you'll allow you, that. You you mean in the sense that he did not start his he, Correct, he, yeah. He, okay, I I I for a second I perked up like he's not a forever Laker meaning Oh, like he, he'll leave. Yeah. Um he's not like hearts and minds and you know on the Mount Rushmore of Lakers. Like when you think of LeBron and you think of his career, I won't think of him as a Laker. I will think of him as a cap, right? I will think of him from Cleveland or Miami. Los Angeles was like the third stop. And and I don't know if that's the defining stop. It's just where he, he kind of went after he won a championship in Cleveland. 
And so, you know, I, he doesn't have that same 20 years with one franchise that Kobe and Dirk did. He doesn't have that Derek Jeter, like, and you know, and you know, transcendent looks, looks like they're going to end up with that. Steph Curry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And maybe Draymond Green and Clay Thompson. And You're right. This is why I've always said, I want these three to ride off in the sunset yeah. together it, forever until the wheels completely fall off. And now they have a couple of young guys in Pajemski and Kaminga yeah. who can at least be the bridge to a decent to very good late stage mm-hmm. Curry team. Um, yep. And this is the question you have. Like the Lakers are 30 and 26. They're eight and three in their last 11 games. They're plus 38 in just 184 minutes with the foursome. I have been begging Darvin Ham yes. to play more all season. Reeves, Hachimura, LeBron, and AD. I think they finally have landed on the right starting lineup and the right rotation. I think Dinwiddie will really help their team. In D'Lo's in, playing well. In very specific ways. Yeah. Um, And that's a, like, you can fantasize about this trade. Like LeBron joins Curry. Certain people from the Warriors would have to be traded to the Lakers just to make mm-hmm. the math work, let alone the the draft picks and whatever else right. that the Lakers would surely demand is either team in that scenario left in a position where they are actually better than their current versions of themselves. Both of which are having these little resurgence 50 games into the season. Let's start with the Lakers. Um, and, and, and look like here, here's where they all also find themselves. The Lakers are ninth, three games out of eighth. The Warriors are 10th, also three games in the loss column out of eighth. They got a bunch of games to make up. Um, Right now, we have all these conversations every day like, are they contenders? Can they win the title? Right now, unless one of those teams makes up three games, they're playing each other in the loser's bracket of the play-in tournament, meaning one of them is not even making the playoffs and is out Mm -hmm. before the play-in tournament is even over, and the other has to win another game just to get into the playoffs. That's where we are. But I do think both these teams are playing pretty well in ways that are sustainable other than some fluky three-point shooting for the Lakers of late. I, I like the way they both look, and I feel like they have found their correct identities, and it just took mm-hmm. a lot of time. And in Golden State's case, it took a suspension, a recovery from mm-hmm. suspension, a semi-public airing of grievances from Jonathan Kaminga against <laughs> Steve Kerr. Not even semi-public, public airing yeah. of grievances um, and a a very public reckoning for Clay Thompson which of what he was on. and what he is. Yeah, which, which is not by the way, yet. still going on. I mean, I think you know the game against the Clippers on Wednesday night. Clay is not in the closing lineup, and then Steve Kerr kind of throws him in at the end of the game because they need shooting. He commits a pretty bad foul in, in, towards the end of the game. Boy, and, led... and boy, I mean, like the body language Ooh. after that. I am not the body language doctor. That's oh. Mr. Simmons's job. Yeah. But Steve Kerr out onto 10 feet mm-hmm. out onto the court with his hands on his head, crouched in agony. And I believe he said clay. I think you could read his lips yep. saying clay. Pajemski, the camera zooms in on Pajemski, who's making like a face yeah and then steph goes to console clay and like low five him and clay kind of walks away from that Mm -hmm. if i'm clay look that was a bad mistake yeah if if i'm clay i'm like man my coach didn't have to run out 15 feet on the floor like that i I know i I know i screwed up did he say i see i didn't see the post game steve kerr basically said uh yeah that's a clear uh play defense no foul situation which is which is true true I mean, but he said it, like, you know, it's not like Sean McVay out there. Oh, that, I'll, I'll take that one. That's on me. I didn't prepare the players. Like, no, <laughs> he kind of was like, yep, you should have known better. My my point is both these teams are good. Mm-hmm. Both these teams are trending the right way. Both of these teams are absolutely going to be dangerous if if they yep. get into the playoffs. Right now, one of them will not be in the playoffs if, if the standings remain as they are. Yeah. Both these teams could absolutely win a series against almost anybody. My my analysis of their contention standards would be that Clippers loss last night, the one you're talking about, is revealing in the sense like Clippers didn't have Kawhi, Warriors are rolling, Clippers rally and win the game. And what both these two teams have in common is their ceilings are really high. They have shown those really high ceilings for two games here, a game here, a game there. To win four games in one series against Oklahoma City, the Clippers, Phoenix, Minnesota, the defending champion Denver Nuggets, whoever it is, is an entirely different animal. To do that and then win four more games against another one of those teams and then four more games against another one of those teams, 
requires a level of consistent, unrelenting greatness that neither of these teams has demonstrated yet. So I cannot quite take them seriously as like contender contenders. Mm-hmm. Could they win a series? Yeah, I like I I have enough respect for them. Like absolutely, they're they both landed on something interesting, even amid these crazy trade talks Agreed. that you and Woj reported on. I know. And I think it's, you know, people yesterday when we first wrote the story, um, well, I'll say Wednesday because people listen to this at different times. But uh, when we first wrote the story, I think some of the reaction was like, oh, this shows the desperation of the Warriors that they don't they 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 don't think they have enough. No way. Disagree. This shows the boldness. Aggression. It shows aggression. that it shows that we are all in on keeping a good team alive as long as Curry is here. Yep. And playing like this, which is, by the way, going like nine of 18 from three yeah. every single game. Um, and they have they owe a 2024 pick that will extinguish this year and then a 2030 pick. They'll be aggressive yeah. this summer, too. I think I think, uh, you it know, by the way, like, Zach, like, be, yeah, speaking of Warriors, Warriors trades that didn't happen or that could have happened or things they were discussed. Remember when Kevin Durant asked for a trade from the Brooklyn Nets? I, I do. I do recall that happening. I, that? I do. Right, I have. I right have, on the eve of free agency. Yeah. Yeah. The Brooklyn, okay. the Brooklyn Nets. Didn't I work remember out being, um, they lost by 50 points leave. last night in Boston last night, by the way. <laughs> the, uh, I was out on maternity leave. I just had the, my second son on June 8th. And I think Kevin's trade request was June 30th. So like, I'm totally sleep deprived newborn stage. Right. And I see this and I like, I'm like, oh my God. Like I almost came right back to work. Like I almost was like, this was seismic that he asked for a trade. Um, and over that summer, you know, there, there was the sort of meetings with James Harden in Europe and there was the back and forth. There was all these, all these conversations with him. He ultimately reconciles because he had four years on his deal. The very well, strange. This was part- after it was reported that he asked for Sean Marks and Steve Nash to be Correct. fired. Correct. From, yeah, fired. from their jobs. Yeah. Very directly. One of whom has since been fired from his job. Right. Um, so then Durant and then and then they have this meeting and then remember they put the joint press release out. It's a great all time. Great. press. All release. time. I'll never forget that one. <laughs> what is this logo? Why is it here? <laughs> the boardroom. Oh, okay. oh everything's great. Yeah. They'll never trade him now. I completely so believe great. that he's going to play the next four years for the Nets and everything's going to be amazing. Yeah. OK, so he goes and he has a, a very good first half. And then they have this sort of exclusive negotiating window with the new owner in Phoenix, with Matt Ishbia, and said, like, okay, listen, he wants to play for Phoenix. We're only going to negotiate with you. And if we don't get it done, then we'll open it up to other people. Like, it was a pocket listing, as a real estate agent would call it. The Warriors did not have the trade assets at that point to go make a run at KD. But if the Suns don't, don't get this done, the Warriors had a ton of assets last summer. So if this doesn't get done... They're going after Kevin Durant last summer. Like that, that that's the, they were plotting and planning of like how can they go get Durant? They're already they're they're always thinking of stars that they can go get. This is the, whatever you want to say, Joe Lightyear's Lake of or whatever. Like the the to me the defining feature of that dynasty besides the Steph Curry and shooting and the Splash Brothers and all that is their boldness. Like they just go and do things like that. They they went out and got Kevin Durant the first time. Why not do it again? Oh, he left. Well, this is also the luxury. He'll come back. Like it's it's boldness. It I mean, it doesn't take like a great deal of vision to think that getting Kevin Durant on your team would be like a good thing to do. Um, but it's also the it's the luxury of of deep 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 pockets. Mm-hmm. And it's the luxury of having Steph Curry who can play with anybody, any kind yep. of player, can accommodate any style of player and will accommodate any style of player. As long as it helps the team win. By the way, he's the most important reason Draymond Green is still on the Warriors because he yeah. understands how integral Draymond Green is yep. to their winning. And it's not a coincidence that their defense has locked up since Draymond Green came back from suspension and started yep. at center. And also their defense and their offense. Like you, you, you know, I forget the numbers on the on the Wiggins Kaminga pairing when Draymond's not on the court, but it's not good. Like it's historically bad when those two are on the court and there's no, but when Draymond's out there, it's great. When Draymond it plays went the five. from It went from chicken, you know what, to the most delicious chicken salad with mustard and the right, the right amount of tarragon and the right amount of <laughs> celery and onions yeah. that you've ever had. Do, does it have like, do, do you cut up the grapes and put it in there? I don't I like, like grapes. I, like I, grapes. Don't grapes. Like, I don't want gra- I don't like grapes in general and I don't want mm-hmm. grapes in my salad or my food. Grape, you I know like what? red the, grapes in the chicken the salad. Skin, there's something about the skin. That I don't oh. like. It's a it's a, it's a very controversial topic in my house. Uh, I don't like cherries. I don't like cherries. Really, and no one can understand why I don't like cherries. Something about the skin I don't like. Oh, 
I, I guess I get that. It gets stuck in your teeth and it feels yeah. like, should we be eating the skin? Or you want my take on the yeah. most underrated fruit? Yeah, I do. By the way, we're pitching a segment on the Low Post podcast. It's called Malika Andrews' Worst Takes because she has she some has ter- horrible yes, takes she really does. on food and pop culture in general. Mm-hmm. And I've recruited Malika. This is going to happen. One of them will be her fruit and vegetable takes. Pear is the I most underrated pear. fruit. And peas I agree. are the most underrated vegetables. I really, you know what? I really love a good pear, especially if it's been, it's cold in the fridge. You don't hear people talk about pears. I love pears. People forget pears are a bucket. Pears are so under, you're right, Zach. Like, and it does, I don't even, it doesn't even have to be a pretty looking pear. If it's, it, it can be lumpy and weird looking. It, I love a pear, but it's got to be cold in the fridge and like cut up. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts on this dalliance between the Lakers or the Warriors and the Warriors or any just thoughts on the state of either team? By the way, the best thing that's happened to these two teams other than all, playing well is Utah trading three tenths of its playing rotation yeah. and going down the standings, which by the way, I understand why they did it. They got a good second round pick. Yeah. They got a, a, an okay first round pick for Olenek, Agbaji and Fontecchio respectively. I just think, man, it stinks. They could have made the play in tournament. I, I wanted them to go I for it. But anyway, to. any part, any parting thoughts? My parting thought is um, one. I love the theater of, of the what if on this one. Um, and also that, this just because it didn't happen doesn't mean that they can't revisit this again. Like this is, this is still like, you can still make all of the math work again and, and things change in the NBA very quickly, depending on how teams play, depending on how seasons finish. What if the Warriors draft Bronny? What, 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 you know, like, let's see what happens this summer. Get that. Like, I, I know we, I I hate this thing that we do where we don't finish one season before we start talking about the next season. Right. Like, Let's let's let Ronnie finish his height, his his freshman year at USC before we start talking about him in the draft or or let's let's see who wins this year before we start talking about free agency next year, because um, I really love basketball and I hate that we always get ahead of the season. But this is so the, the, the possibilities here are so delicious. You can't you can't unsee them now that you've seen the possibility. Right. Like the, it wasn't that hard to Photoshop the, the warrior jersey on LeBron. Uh, he has a jet. There's an airport in Van Nuys. It's it's really easy to fly back and forth. Draymond Green lives in LA. They can they can go together. He lives in Brentwood with near LeBron. Like <laughs> that could I don't think it will. I think the Lakers go star hunting this summer and try to fortify the relationship around the the team around LeBron. By I think far none of the this most likely ha- path is we yeah. go our separate ways and we up the Lakers upgrade yeah. here, the Warriors upgrade there. But it, it, you are giving us an interesting coda here. And and I think what's fun about it is that everyone involved does exactly what you think they would do. Like LeBron with the passive aggressive stuff, the Warriors with the audacity, the Lakers with the, we just want them to be happy. You know, Jeannie Buss with the, we just want to take care of our stars and make sure they're happy here. Um, the, the, the Draymond recruiting and, and like everyone plays the part. Daryl Morey they, jumping in yeah. and be like, can we get, can we get LeBron <laughs> and Durant for the yeah, Anthony maybe. Melton and four first round picks? Yeah. Yeah, what do you what do you, what do you guys think of B-ball Paul? You know, I like, hey. I like B-ball Paul. All right, Ramona Shelburne, just indispensable work. By the way, you're about to be. Uh, it's a good thing you came on because you're about to be too famous to come on this podcast ever oh, again. On. Once the Sterling affairs I'm, I'm, comes, I'm very behind comes, the scenes. To, comes to the airwaves. Um, right. So it's been nice knowing you <laughs> and being able to talk basketball with you because you are about to be a Hollywood starlet celebrity and uh, I'll miss you when that happens. I have and a 20 I second hope... cameo with no speaking lines in that, in the, uh, and do you one. have, do you also have an EP credit? I do. Oh, I okay. Do. So, so look, when you're on the red carpet and your former you're... colleague at, I walked the red carpet with your former colleague at Grantland, Rembert Brown, who is a producer I... on the show as well. Well, who was it, it... Rembert was wearing some fabulous leather pants. He wore a full, Leather pant, leather jacket outfit to the TCA the other day. Look, I'm just saying when you when you're walking the red carpet and you hear a voice that's like Ramona, Ramona, just a quick, just a quick question for you, Ramona, and you and you look and it's me. Just remember and give just give me the one question. That's all I'm saying. Just give me the I'll, one. I'll question. always give you the one question. Make it Ramona, about hairs. Ramona Shelburne, everybody, thank you. Thanks, Zach. All right, it's Friday morning. 
I am taping this with the one and only John Hollinger, one of my inspirations for getting into this business to begin with, which is weird because I might be older than him. I'm not sure. Uh, we are taping this about 15 hours after Ramona <laughs> Shelburne and I had a conversation about just the whole Warriors Lakers nexus of greatness slash drama slash trade talks slash play in hopes and dreams and mini resurgences in the season. And and this podcast with John Hollinger was ostensibly supposed to be and will be a check in on some of the rookies around the league. That's a good way to talk about a bunch of teams. And in the interim, a couple of Warriors related things happen that are fortunately for us also rookie related. Clay Thompson, who Ramona and I talked at length about yesterday, was relegated in what must be a tough wrenching decision for everybody involved to the bench. And wouldn't you know it, like the steely, bad, tough dude that he is, a guy that the Spurs, Chip England, who's now with the Thunder, once told me when the Spurs brought Clay Thompson in for a secret second workout ahead of that draft, in which I believe they took Kawhi Leonard. That might be all the same draft. I can't remember. Um, Clay, something about him reminded Chip of Manu Ginobili. And when he when he said that to himself and to the brass, he remembers the arms on his the hairs on his arms standing up because just to utter the name of Ginobili was that sacrosanct in San Antonio. Obviously, this is a different scenario. This is a guy at the end of his career coming off the bench. 35 points for Clay Thompson in a win that shoves the Utah Jazz four games out of the play. And we can probably say goodbye to the Jazz. But as for rookies, Mr. Hollinger, Clay Thompson was replaced in the starting lineup by a rookie, Brandon Pajemski, who is just good. And one of the more polarizing rookies in the league, a guy that I've liked ever since I've seen him, but the shooting stats are what they are. Keontae George had a monster game. So mm -hmm. let's start. Let's start there. Um, you dig into the draft and it, it much more than I do. Um, are you surprised how good Pajemski has been? Um, and after you get through that, we'll talk about the Warriors. Uh, I am I am not surprised by his output in terms of points, rebounds. Where I am a little surprised is how well he's held up defensively, because that looked like a real question mark on the tape coming out of Santa Clara. His statistical indicators like blew up all the analytics models, so he was one of my favorite sleepers uh, in the draft because of that, but I definitely had him in the sleeper group as opposed to like, hey, this is a top 10 guy just because the the defense, like you, you just didn't know, like you even against West Coast Conference competition, you'd see some like really iffy clips. He's held up surprisingly well on that end. He's developed a knack, knack for taking charges, which I think has really helped him. And to me, this whole move for Golden State is them trying to get to – next year's team now it, that's what it feels like to me like that Kamig is in place now pods is in place now uh i suspect trace jackson davis is going to be in there somewhere and it seems like moody is maybe the the odd man out for some reason even though like i think he can play but uh he's kind of lester quinones has been playing ahead of him which is okay um <laughs> but uh a little surprising yeah, yeah. So that he may be the piece that ends up in whatever trade they make to get another guy, uh, especially probably another front court guy. And so that that that's what it felt like to me, just the, acknowledging the reality of like, OK, we're 52 games into this. We're 26 and 26, which is what they were before going into Utah last night. Uh, you know, they'll probably finish up on the good side of 500 just because of the way the league is this year with, you know, you have six or seven teams that are just automatic wins right now. And at the same time, it's, they're going to be going through the play in. If they make it out of that, that first round, whatever first round series they have, I mean, it's not, not looking great. Right. So, so let's, let, so I, my whole thing with both the Warriors and the Lakers, the Lakers are eight and three in their last 11 games. The Warriors are nine and four in their last 13 games. I talked a lot about both teams with Ramona, so we don't need to dive into sort of what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, is I, I would never slam the door shut on these guys making a medium sized playoff run slash a deep playoff run. I just have too much respect for the cores and what they've accomplished. However, neither team has demonstrated anything close to the level of consistency and greatness day to day. 
that is necessary to win four playoff games against one great team, four against another great team, four against another great team. Maybe this is the beginning of that process, that these runs that they're on, at t- time will tell. But as, as you said, right now they're ninth and 10th, so one will eliminate the other if, unless the standings change. And the standings might change. They're three games behind Dallas and Sacramento, who are seven and eight, and Sacramento's not playing very well. Um, although they they finished with a win over Denver before the All Star break, Denver. Yeah, that's, that'll just be my whole Denver analysis. Is just that noise. Yeah. I'm not worried yet. Not worried yet. I'm 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 on the way to being maybe a little slightly worried. I would still pick Denver to make the finals, but I, you know. Phoenix, Bradley Beal got hurt again. They have 22 losses. The Pelicans have 22 losses. Those are five and six. I have no idea what the New Orleans Pelicans are. And I'm starting to think none of us ever will be. They'll just be a mystery forever and ever. Um, so maybe what maybe they move up. One of these teams moves up in the standings. Um, we'll see. It sounds like you're pessimistic. Uh, I could see... I could see them moving on. I mean, they have ground to make up and there's not a lot of time left in the season is one of the things that are working against both these teams. But can they at least get to eight, seven, where you just have to win one play-in game? I mean, that's what the that was what the Lakers did last year, right? They got to they got to seven, held on in the play-in game against Minnesota, and then, you know, won two rounds in the playoffs. We had LA Golden State each week each win as low seeds in the first round. Now I will say it's a tougher West this year. I mean, those top four teams in the West are all tough. And so where, whereas last year you had Memphis, uh, they were the two, they were already a little injured. They, you know, they'd lost Adams already. Um, and you had Sacramento as, as the three, who was definitely, you know, they had a great year, especially given their history, but it was definitely a beatable three. I, you're not getting that in the first round. You're playing the Clippers. You're playing the Wolves. You're playing OKC. You're playing Denver. Like those are almost certainly your top four. And just that, unless unless there's an injury somewhere along the line again, like I, those are not going to be uh, very friendly first round series. Let's talk about the other rookie who exploded last night. Keontae George, 33 points, nine threes, which I believe either ties or broke the record for the most threes any rookie has ever made in a game. Uh, he is now averaging 12 points and four assists, 39% shooting. He's up to 35% on threes, 45% on twos. Um, he's starting now. They've, they've, along with this sort of, we're going to trade 30% of our rotation, uh, they have flipped Chris Dunn out of the starting five and said, okay, it's sink or swim yeah. time for Keontae. George just went poorly in the first 15 games. Then he was coming off the bench, settled himself. Um, look, most rookie guards are inefficient. There's just something about his vision. He's he's just a good, he's a good passer. He sees the floor. He can make the cross-court corner pass with either hand. Um, and he's got just a nice little bit of craft to his game. Like last night on on one pick and roll, he rejected the screen going to his right, froze the, the drop back big with a hesitation dribble, hit him with a right hand and in and out dribble and finished with a layup. I was like, damn, that's a lot of it's a lot of crap. I just he's six four with like a six five, six six wingspan. So if he's your lead guard, if he's your uh, if he's essentially your point guard or your smallest guy on the floor, he's got good enough size for that position. If you shift him to the wing, it gets a little dicey. But the Jazz have said all along. He's a, quote, lead guard. Call him whatever you want. We want him to be our lead guard. And the more I watch him, the more I'm like, yeah, I, I'm kind of in for this guy as like the Utah Jazz lead guard of the future. There's going to be some bumps in the road, but I think they've got a legit starting lead guard in Keontae George. What do you think? Uh, Quite quite possibly. Uh, le- Like you said, I mean, rookie guards get their butts kicked. And so when, when you see one who can at least – you know, handle a decent size usage role with a modicum of efficiency. It's like, okay, there's a, there's a runway here to get a lot better. Uh, it's interesting to me that he's been able to play, to play the point and look like a real point guard because at, you know, watching him at Baylor, it seemed now they played with three guards. So it was a little different. He was definitely heavier at Baylor, which I think slowed him down. And he, he just looked like a lot more like an undersized two. And, hmm. And so for for him to be a one at his size, now that changes everything kind of. And especially if he can shoot consistently 
from the perimeter, which has been a little up and down. Obviously, he made a bunch uh, last last night. And then can he, can he add to that? Like, he's not a crazy athlete, so he does have to rely on craft a lot for finishing. And I think that's why, you know, he's only shooting 39% or whatever on the season. But that's another thing that guys really can develop over time. And he, and he kind of, he kind of, he has the skill now to, to create stuff. And now it's just a question of being more efficient out of what he creates. And I, I do think it's, you know, Utah clearly is trying to moonwalk back into that 10th pick, I think, but at the same yeah, time, I'm sad. I know why they're doing it. I, you just said why they're doing it. it, it yeah. Even bigger picture, just like we're, we're still a young team on the rise. Let's not forget that. I just thought they were pretty solid as they were. And I wanted to see them like, there's always a feisty team who's like, wait, they just beat out the Warriors for a play in birth. Like I kind of yeah. wanted Utah to go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Because they were, they were on a nice little roll too. They had, because, because they started the year so badly and then they, they got on a really nice roll. Really the last, the last few weeks, Colin Sexton's played massively better. Uh, they kind of worked out what they were doing in the backcourt with Dunn, Dunn starting because they, they just didn't have enough ball movement. Otherwise uh, they figured out how to get in the front court, find a role for John Collins, bring Kessler off the, like everything they were doing just kind of worked. And now we're, we're back to like very free form experimentation and, you know, let's see what this looks like next year. And basically they're, they're on, they're another team. They're on next year right now. What was Keonti George's, um, defense like in college what did he project as a defender if if he were able to guard the smallest guy on the floor if he were not over overtaxed size wise it it was it was uh middle of the pack i mean there there was nothing remarkable either way to kind of at least in my estimation what have you thought of him on the nba level in that in that regard i again i you know, could he, could he be, yeah, yeah. Could he be a little zippier on the perimeter? Maybe could it be a little more, you know, you want your, 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 your one, your point guard to be maybe a little more handsy, create a little more, you know, turnovers, whatnot. I don't know if that's ever going to be like his main thing, but you know, kinda, he's also, I, he also has size working for him, which, which a lot of big guards don't. So the switches are easier and everything. So I, again, probably like middle, it's, it's, it is neither going to vault his career ahead nor uh, hold him back, I don't think. I mean, his offense is going to be what determines whether he sinks or swims. Sure. I'm a little more optimistic about his defense than you are. Okay. He's he's, he's in glimpses, like all rookies. Mm -hmm. He's shown me kind of a toughness, like getting around. He, he did really well guarding Steph last night, getting around screens, fighting around screens. He has a nose for steals off the ball, but not the kind of steals where he's like being reckless and gambling all over the place. I, I've got my eye on him. Uh, okay. We should mention we should mention his fellow rookie, Taylor Hendricks, is now going to play for the Utah Jazz. How much is unclear. But to your point about how the Jazz had landed on a functional good rotation, part of the reason they did that was, as you mentioned, separating John Collins and Walker Kessler, who have to do more or less the same thing on offense. I looked up their number, and now, of course, they're starting together because the Jazz are just out of choices. Uh, I looked up their numbers for the season. In 268 minutes, with John Collins and Walker Kessler on the floor together, the Jazz are minus 103, minus 19 points for 100 possessions. It's that's like you're getting to the point where it's hard to be that bad when you yeah. play two good NBA players of any ilk and size together and Hendricks is is I, they're going to try and use him as a way to sort of um break up the Markin and Kessler Collins combination so he comes in for one of the rim runners and it's Markin and Hendricks and either Collins or Kessler Jazz fans have been clamoring for Taylor Hendricks to play all season. I get it. He he is a very interesting prospect on both ends of the floor, has made plays already defensively. He looks, to put it kindly, frenetic on offense right now to the point that uh, he committed two traveling violations last night within 90 seconds of entering the game almost. And they were the same. He just caught the ball and went into a dribble move, and the refs were like, the thing you just did with your feet, you're not allowed <laughs> 
to do that in basketball. What was the Hendricks projection for you and what have you seen? I mean, limited minutes, but he's interesting and he's important to their team. Top 10. Pick. Yeah. Uh, so d- definitely he was a guy who stood out for his potential at the defensive end, the ability to switch on the guards, but still provide a rim protector, uh, and then had a pretty good looking outside shot uh, leans a uh, little bit of leading tower, a piece of action, like leans to his left when he shoots. So I, uh, straightening that out a little would probably help him, uh, uh, on the ball as a shot creator was definitely the biggest question mark where, you know, where is he going to fit in with that? He doesn't quite, uh, he's, he's more of a glider, I would say, than a guy who like pops off the floor where you're going to be throwing, throwing him alley-oops as a rim runner. Not, not that he can't do that, but he's not, he's not like at John Collins level doing that. And then is he, he doesn't really have a wide frame. So he's not really a guy who's going to score on the block either. So getting to his offense, like even, at, even at UCF last year, uh, you know, the guards had the ball most of the time and he was kind of the, uh, secondary guy. And so his offensive role is probably the biggest question. He, I, I do think he could do the stretch part at least adequately. It's what else he's going to give you beyond that, because I, the way the game is going, like you, you can't just be that guy out there who's an okay three point shooter and, and have it be enough. Yeah. Uh, he's 15 of 46 on three so far, which is, I think, encouraging for a rookie tweener forward slash big who has not played much eight assists, 15 turnovers is a little problematic, but um, you know, this is, this is all beginning stages for him. Let's go to a rookie and a game that is a little closer to your heart and soul. John Hollinger. Uh, Victor Wembanyama leads all rookies in points per in points per I think points overall and points per 36 minutes, which I have up Mm -hmm. as a big column right now. 26 points per 36 minutes. Cam Whitmore is second, 25 points per 36 minutes. And that dude is going to shoot like there. There are some certainties in life. And one (laughs) of them. And I like I like certainties. I like I like bedrock things that I can rely on. Cam Whitmore is going to come in the game. And shoot the goddamn ball. And you know what? I'm happy about that. He's good at it. He is a tank going to the rim. He can shoot threes pretty well. I'm intrigued by the Cam Whitmore experience. I want more of it. Number three in points per 36 minutes among rookies. The recently suspended for one game, G.G. Jackson Jr., who lit up the Milwaukee Bucks last night. The Milwaukee Bucks. Alleged title contenders boasting an MVP candidate who frankly has not gotten enough attention in the MVP race, Giannis Antetokounmpo, who I think missed like three shots last night total. Two. And Damian, it, two. Okay, I don't It was not very many. 15 of 17, and they lost. And they lost. And Damian Lillard, as well as on their team, Chris Middleton's out with an ankle injury, whatever. They uh, went into the Memphis, uh, went into whatever, what is it, the FedEx Forum still? Um, FedEx Forum, yes. Facing a Grizzlies team that you can name every player on, I can name every player on almost no one in the arena could name every player on that team. And the bucks lost that Damian Lillard had a heave at the end of the game. They are now three and seven under doc rivers. Their offense is 24th in that span. Their defense is 10th. So if you're, if you're a glass half full guy, you would say doc came in to repair the defense. That process has started at the expense of their offense uh, but they don't, their offensive rebounding has disappeared. Guess what? Their transition defense is much better. Those two things are linked. Their free throws have gone in the toilet. Their shots at the rim have gone way down. Uh, but if you're a glass half full guy, you would say job one was fixing the defense. If that is a temporary setback on the offensive end, fine. But boy, oh boy, three and seven. And how about that GG Jackson Jr., man? Holy smokes. He's shooting 41% on threes. He's six nine. So he's just yeah. shooting over people. He's shooting from 30 feet out. He pulled up for like a 35-footer in transition last night that he missed. And and God love him. He missed it with like 20 on the shot clock. And the the ball, the rebound, Bucks got it. And GJ did the he he did the padded his chest, like, my bad, my bad. Yeah, the, we know it was your bad, man. Like, <laughs> we, like I'm glad you're acknowledging it. No, it was clearly nobody else's bad. It was a bad shot, yeah. but at least he admitted it was a bad shot. This guy went 45th in the draft, and he can do a little bit of everything on offense. He's a great screen and dive guy. He's making good passes out of it. 
Um, defensively, it's a little hit or miss, but he's got size, and when he when he's engaged, I think he's okay. What what is this dude? Do they have they they have something here? Like they, they, they might they, they yeah they this? might have something. So a little bit bird of bird of a feather with Whitmore. Like this guy is definitely shooting. Um, but the the other thing is that three point number. I mean that's that's the whole key here. He has no track record of shooting this well. He, he was a low thirties guy at South Carolina, low thirties guy in summer league, low thirties guy in the G League for half a season with more attempts than he's had in the you're, NBA you're this year. Bursting my bubble, you're bursting my bubble with this. However, analysis. However. He does not need to shoot 40% to have an impact because, as you point out, he is big. He provides secondary shot blocking. I think he's actually maybe grown a little since South Carolina even. Uh, he he can do other things as a, as a shot creator. Like, he can put it on the floor a little. He's threatening going to the basket again because of his size. Uh, and Memphis has really been looking for this, like this search for a big wing. I mean, they th- threw countless draft picks at this, trying to find one and basically failed, and now – this guy that that they got in the second round, uh, pick pick forty five. You, you said that's been. I think uh, so. Yeah, that's been a very uh, very good pick for the Grizzlies in recent years. None of this. Look, the shooting you you have to sustain it, right? Like you yeah. have to sustain it somewhere between the numbers you cited and what's going on now. It doesn't have to. He doesn't have to be a crazy high volume forty percent three point shooter. It'd be nice. Um, nothing about this seems fake or like oh this is empty calorie stuff on a bad team that is just someone's got to score the points this yeah you you always worry about that a little in in this kind of situation so i'm i'm glad you brought that up because he definitely has the freedom right now to take whatever shot and it's fine and that's going to go away next year when the when the cavalry comes back but when the cavalry is back and by the way you know our our brains our short-term long-term memories are are not as good as they need to be like this team before everything was rising to a point where you were like, yeah, you know, they disappointed in the playoffs last year. This is going to be an elite team for a long, long time. And like yeah. in John Morant's absence, Desmond Bain leveled up in the absence of everybody. Jaron Jackson Jr. has gotten to stretch himself on offense probably too far. But if you look at his passing numbers from the past two months, you know, I wrote about him a couple of weeks ago in, in my 10 things column at that point. I think the stat I had was he had like seven games of five or more assists ever in his career. And like five of them had come in the prior two weeks, which is like good and healthy development. This dude, he won't have the same freedom. If you take a 35 footer in semi transition with John Moran on one side and Desmond Bain on the other and you miss, that's not going to go over great. But his basic bedrock skill set is kind of plug and play with this team. Like, I think this is real ish and you know i'd have to dig in more to how this guy slipped to 45 because he's he, he's in, well the shooting maybe is part of yeah, it yeah he was a, he was a, he was a top 10 guy coming out of high school and he had a horrible year at south carolina the team sucked uh they uh i'm not sure how well coached they were the offense was basically just give him the ball and let him do whatever and he did whatever and and so his numbers ended up being pretty bad but again if you looked at the kind of the baseline skill set. And I think one of the things that we maybe overreact to, and I see people doing it with Ron Holland this year, is that when you take somebody that young and and just plop them into a very high usage role, especially with not a crazy amount of talent around them, like they're they're gonna struggle, especially out of the shoot. Like it's just it's the game isn't that easy for them not to. We saw it with LaMelo Ball in Australia. We saw it with Scoot even last last year at Ignite and the beginning of this year in Portland. Uh, so I I just think that's a thing that people overreact to sometimes. Um, let's let's just veer briefly into like the Bucks are three and seven under Doc Rivers, and it it like doesn't it doesn't it's just. Something is off. Like, even when their offense was number two, it's now down to number five overall. Like something's just a little off here. You know, last night, I think I read Doc made a joke about how, you know, some guys were already on the way to Cabo during the game. So you don't want to read too much into, like, the all-star farewell game. But, like, are you like if you're a serious team, you kind of win that game. Where are you on the Bucks? How, how worried are you? Uh, I think they're a little short on talent, is is what I think. They're, um, they, they miss Chris Middleton right now, definitely. And part of the reason is because they don't 
they just don't have the players who can step up into the void. Uh, Bobby Portis and Pat Connaughton have both kind of taken a step back this year, which I think has really hurt them. I think that's why you heard those guys, those two names so much going into the trade deadline uh, for them to try to get different pieces. Um, you know, the campaign for Pat Beverly, I think is like, in terms of the problems they're facing, I think it's potato, potato. I mean, it, it's nice that they have somebody who can heat up the ball now. Like Memphis is playing Vince Williams Jr. at point guard and the Bucks like don't, don't even pressure him because they just don't have anybody who can do it. Uh, so that, that that's that part certainly stood out to me last night. Uh, they, they're just very, very thin. And then Dame has not been Dame, I think, is the, is the other piece of it. If you look he's, at it, he's shooting 34% from three. And even if that part comes back, like the rest of his game just hasn't been at the level even from a year ago in Portland. It's been a difficult – him and Giannis together has been a much more difficult adjustment, I think, than people thought. It's been – strange and i've harped and many others have about how how relatively rarely rarely they use this two-man game that everyone thought was going to be yeah it, it plug in plug in and it's like number two in the whole league behind murray and Jokic. but even beyond just how rarely they use it in comparison to some of the other weapons they have it just hasn't it just hasn't looked easy it hasn't looked right and there are games like last night in memphis is a great example where dame just looks like a quarter step out of rhythm. Like he gets into the lane and he's missing shots at the rim that he normally would make. Or like the, the read is the passing read is like a half second slower or doesn't have, it just, something is just out of rhythm and you know, look, Middleton will help. And then he shoves Crowder to the bench, which fortifies their bench. But like, it's not like Cr Crowder has been okay. It's not like he's you're like Crowder, Phoenix Crowder, where you could be like, oh, this guy might put up 18 for us tonight, is doesn't appear to be coming around the corner. The no. Bucks are 35 and 21. They're four games behind Cleveland now. And, and and the underlying numbers aren't any better, is 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 the part that sticks out to me. I mean, they're 11th in net rating. And I mean, they've we say they miss Middleton, but like they've basically been healthy this year, right? It's not like, oh, we've just been, you know. We've just been, you know, putting together patchwork lineups and stuff. It's like, I mean, beyond the fact that their regular lineup is a little bit patchwork, right? Like they they haven't been hit that way. And they're just like, I'm just to the point where it's, I just don't know how good they actually are. You know, we were talking, I was talking to a couple of people, you know, who would you pick in a Bucks, Knicks, Bucks, Cavs? series i mean shove the sixers to the side we'll see what it yeah. looks like you know and you're and you're you just those two names are such above the marquee names that you want to just say well in the playoffs like the best guys they usually win but i don't know i don't know if i would pick the bucks over either of those teams right now i mean cleveland's got a lot to prove in the playoffs after last year yeah but the bucks have a lot to prove as like a team and they signed danilo gallinari who, you know, I mean, I'm is there are there minutes for Danilo? like Danilo Gallinari is a center now. He is like totally mummified. He could not move at all. He can shoot, but he can't move. Yeah. I don't know. Are there like great is there are there minutes for him? Like you I I don't know where they come from. You'd have to play Portis at the four with the second unit, I guess. That or or is he, you know, are you signing him as a depth guy? Fine. Like, you know, if we have another big injured, then we have this guy we can put in. If that's all it is, then that's fine. But yeah, for him to for him to come in and play right away, I just I just don't see how he's making an impact on a high level team that already has an offense guy playing backup five. You know, look again, their their offense is cratered under Doc. Their defense is surged. Maybe there's a 15 game stretch coming where you get the best of both worlds. But at some point, you got to get the best of both worlds. And when a team doesn't give you the best of both worlds for 50, 60, 70 games. It usually just means they're not going to. Um, but as long as they have Giannis, it's sort of like you, TBD. Like it, it could come at any time because that dude is an absolute monster and nobody wants any part of facing that guy in a in a playoff series. But it, it their play has been worrisome. And you can throw that loss last night away as a Cabo, one, two, three, Cancun loss, whatever. That's an three point Three point variance too. Well, yeah, they went yeah. like nine of 40 something and the Grizzlies <laughs> Bucks were... Bucks were 11 of 44. Grizzlies were 13 of 26. So when when the opponent doubles your three point percentage, you usually lose. 
still kind of embarrassing, honestly. I agree. But yeah, you're you're right. Um, you're right. Uh, okay, let's talk about some other rookies. Rapid fire that I want to talk about that are not the rookie of the year guys who we will talk about later. Mm -hmm. Um, is there anything interesting to say about Brandon Miller? Who I, I say that because if you've been paying attention, and not that many people do pay attention to the Charlotte Hornets, you do and I do. This guy looks like a star, like 16 and a half points a game. He's now neck and neck with Chet. Uh, four rebounds, two assists, 44% shooting, 39% on three. Has a good mid-range game, including a knack for like weird, awkward, like half hooks and little mini jumpers over shorter guys can beat switch. They're running like Brandon Miller, Trey Mann inverted pick and rolls right now after the trade. He's kind of like the point guard of the team almost at, at times or like co-point guard, which will obviously not be the case when they get anything close to hole defensively he's solid like he provides a little rim protection he's switchy these chase down blocks are happening regularly I, I mean I say is there anything interesting to say because I think it's pretty clear already they nailed this pick and this guy is going to be a really really good player and probably like he looks like a future all-star to me I don't know what, you, what you, I mean obviously his efficiency stats his advanced numbers all that stuff are are not great and are lacking compared to Chet and Wemby, but that's all typical rookie stuff. Like, I love what I see. Yeah, he... So, defensively, I think right from the word go, he was pretty good, and it was hard to... It was hard to distill that, I think, in the first half of the season when the rest of Charlotte's defense was such a mess. But now that they kind of post-trade it deadline, at least the last few games, have had their act together a little more, You you can, you can see it. Three game winning uh, has, streak. Yeah. And he had like he has size, but he can play on the perimeter uh at six nine. Still not like a great finisher around the basket, still doesn't have great burst off the dribble. And I think that could put maybe a cap on what his upside is. But it's nice to see him shooting the ball well from the perimeter because he struggled with that a little early in the year. His shot can come out a little flat. And just getting enough air under it for the NBA three point line, I think was a little bit of an adjustment, but now he's <laughs> up to 38% from three. And I, the Brandon versus Scoot debate, I think is going to keep going to continue at least for a little while. But at some point as a team, I think the thing you do need to think about is what the opportunity is going to be like for that player too. And I think it was just going to be hard to do Scoot and LaMelo. Like if Scoot hits, you're definitely getting to a situation where you're trading one of them. Right. And you might not be taking back full value on that. And so I I have to think that weighed on them at least a little bit in in making this selection that Miller had this opportunity to to be what he was going to be without any kind of interference from the rest of the from how the roster was set up. And so we'll see how this works out still for Charlotte. But right now, I mean, right now, Miller is playing better than Scoot, clearly. So uh, you would say advantage. Charlotte now Miller's also what a year year and a half older too so they're you know that plays into it looks like just a full year yeah and he but like he's had games where he's the number one option on the team and he puts up 30 something on efficient shooting and the the opposing defense halfway through the game is like oh shit, we gotta we gotta like scheme to take the ball mm -hmm. out of this guy's hands like this is a legit for at least this game number one option that we're kind of scared of. And like, that's yeah. when defense start treating you like that, that's a, that's a little badge of honor. Uh, but as you said, these draft pick debates are rarely settled after a year or two years Witness the Franz Wagner, Jonathan Kaminga pendulum swing kept all my Kaminga stock for years. It's finally going to pay off for me. <laughs> um, but, but I think we've already reached a point where I would have a hard time envisioning any scenario where Charlotte like regrets this pick, like looks back at this pick with deep, deep regret. And that's a good place to start. Let's move on to Scoot. Scoot was next on my list because Scoot Anderson got moved into the starting lineup for the Blazers last night. And they were down 41 to 13 after you blinked to the Minnesota Timberwolves. Um, Scoot has had a, a, a strange look. It was always going to be for a rookie point guard on a bad team with a bad jump shot. The track record suggested this was going to be ugly. Yeah. Then he has an ankle injury that sidelines him for the early part of the season. He comes back and it's like, well, Malcolm Brogdon's over here sometimes. 
Anthony Simons is over here. Sometimes like, am I the point guard? Am I an off guard? Am I starting? I'm not starting. Um, it's just, and like the whole front line is just constantly half available. And when Grant and Aiton are not available, it's like, these are, I mean, deep, deep cut NBA guys. Although I do like job wreath, uh, because that dude will shoot. Um, and he will shoot a lot of threes. Um, uh, another rookie, another rookie. Hey, look, he's, he's, he's like 43, but still he he's, he's something. I, I don't know what, but he's something. And and Scoot is averaging 13 points a game, almost five assists, 37% shooting, 31% on threes, which honestly, like, I'm almost encouraged by 31% on threes. What's problematic is 41% on twos, 46% at the rim, which is, like, a little disturbing. Yeah. And you because of the context of the Blazers being bad, young, injury riddled, different lineups every single night. You just haven't seen a lot of like the, Oh my God takes to the basket where his athleticism and speed really sing. Um, but his pick and roll numbers are actually not that bad on second spectrum. And he has like some kind of craft and vision to his game. That is interesting. I do find it a little surprising that teams, including Minnesota last night, but more teams, I should say, don't just like go 10 feet under every screen and dare him. To, like if you go over a screen on him, you're doing him a favor. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. I honestly, it's it's too early. I don't know quite what to make of Scoot. It's been a strange season, but there's like eight pick and rolls a game where I'm like, oh, that didn't look like a a 20 year old or whatever with no, with no NBA experience. Like that was, that was interesting. And it's not because of the speed and explosiveness. It's because he'll stop, slow down, pin a guy on his hip, read the floor, make a nice pass or hit a hit, you know, zigzag for a layup. It I'm interested to see how the next 20 games go for him. Let's put it that way. But where, where are you on, on scoot? Cause it has been just, it's been weird. Yeah. I've been encouraged by the last few weeks because his, his numbers as of like Christmas were tragic, right? And uh since since then I think he's really come around. He the decision making as a, as a point guard in terms of getting getting the ball to other people, he has that. Uh so he'll he can, he can make the passes. It's can he be threatening enough as an offensive player to create enough room for those passes? And you're you see you know, teams are going to go under against him. Obviously, he's try he he likes that pull up a lot from the mid range. Uh, it's still not a great shot for him right now. And then the other thing you, you see with him is like he's pretty athletic, but he's not like the John Morant, John Wall level athletic. Where even though the guy goes under, he's still fast enough to beat him to the other side. Like he's not quite doing that. And I think that's why he relies on that pull up a lot. And you see, like when he, a lot of his finishes at the rim, they're um, they're below the rim. There, I mean, he has some dunks this year, but a lot of them are, you know, contested below the rim. And he still, he still doesn't quite have that craft as a finisher of going up against somebody six inches taller than him and figuring out how to get the ball around the guy and in the cup. He had a euro step finish around towns last night on the pick and roller. I was like, Oh, that was, that was snazzy. I just, it, I I'm just, it's just so early and the context has been um, so strange. Uh, he, he's shooting 36% on long twos, which is not, it's not terrible. It's, uh, it's actually close to terrible. Um, it's not, it's not great, but it's not as bad as I would have thought. The, the other thing I'll say with scoot is that like the background on him coming into the draft about his, work ethic and kind of what he's about was all crazy a positive. plus like a plus and so i think you worry less about you still worry about it but about somebody who comes in as a non-shooter if you know they're going to put in a ridiculous amount of hours trying to become a shooter yeah i'm not i'm just curious it's just been an I, and the fact that he started we'll see we'll see if that lasts simon's by the way not a great season when healthy and certainly not the step up in volume and efficiency you were you were, at least in even in volume you would hope to have seen given his given you know that he's now the guy on offense in Portland but again weird team but I I haven't loved Anthony Simons's play this year yeah and 
you wonder what that means for Portland just from where they're going with all this and trade value and whatnot. Like Simons to me, his best thing on a good team would be as a sixth man. And I just don't know that that's where his head is right now. And, and that the, like can the Blazers even afford to have him as a sixth man. They have to, what they're going to start somebody who's like five times worse, just, just so he can be in his eventual role when they're theoretically good someday. So I, it's, it's just tough there all around and they've had to be fair they've had some injuries that have made things tougher but there's just there's just not enough real nba players to go around there right now um speaking of six men and things of that nature there is a jalen green amen thompson thing going on in houston right now where amen thompson has burst out of a bench role into a starting role with Fred Van Vliet injured and the Rockets have kind of fallen way out now of the play and mm-hmm. race without Van Vliet. But Thompson has been productive. Jalen Green has been wildly up and down with some horrible games and that has resulted in him getting bench late in games. And I saw some talk on Rockets Twitter yesterday about like, is a lineup change coming when Fred Van Vliet returns from it? I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I haven't talked to their coaches about it. But tell me what you've seen. I, I'm a big Asar Thompson fan. I, w- I was from day one in Detroit. He's playing more and playing better now. Just please, God, let the jump shot come. You could say the same thing, I guess, for Amon Thompson. But tell me what you've yeah. seen from him in some recent games. Yeah, I mean, just watching him against New York where he had five steals. Uh, and, like, he just appears out of nowhere and help defense. And, like, just his hands. Went, like It's almost Kawhi-like the, the way he was doing it. He just, like... Just, just the jail Brunson is working one-on-one then all of a sudden whoop, the hands in there and it's taking the ball away. And to do that at, at his size, I mean, he has such, such a high ceiling at the, at the defensive end offensively, as you say, he's still figuring it out. He was able to do some cool stuff as a cutter uh, and as an offensive rebounder plays almost as a four or five at the offensive end, especially and with Shangun operating a little bit away from the basket and with his ability to see those cuts and, and hit him at the right times. I I think that weaponizes that a little bit. It's going to be interesting again, with just the, the non shooting piece, both brothers are shooting 15% from three, which is, I actually looked up the (laughs) numbers. Unbelievable. I looked up the numbers for Amen Thompson just now. And I thought when I saw 15%, from three that I had looked up the wrong Thompson twin. <laughs> no, he's six of 38 of threes. Now he's shooting 59% on twos, which is quite encouraging at 86 assists, 53 turnovers for a rookie is pretty encouraging too. Yeah. And uh, I mean, at overtime elite, I'm in play as a point guard. Like he, yeah. he can, he can be that guy, except he, except everyone's just playing so far off him that it, it doesn't open anything else up in the offense, it's almost like a, like a Ben Simmons type thing. If you can remember when Ben Simmons was good like that, now that, that Ben Simmons, Philadelphia. Now he is, um, six, seven and fast. And to your point about how Morant and John wall and Russ in his prime could beat that go under everything scheme with just sheer speed, speed plus length plus He's shooting 63% at the line, which isn't great, but I don't think he's afraid to get fouled. And, you know, you mentioned the deterioration of Ben Simmons. Like, that's that's what it is. Ben Simmons is afraid to get fouled. He Like, as soon as he gets the ball over half court, he's looking to get off of it, and he plays sideline to sideline only. He's not going any further into the paint with the ball. He has six free throws the entire season. Um, So, I, but I, I... I like what I've seen from Amin Thompson. He's explosive. He plays hard. And they envisioned him as a lead playmaker, potentially. Like with the Rockets draft very openly for star potential, star, star, star. Mm-hmm. And I think their view on Amin Thompson was if he hits, which I think translates to like if the jumper becomes manageable, um, this guy could be a legit lead ball handler. Yeah. Um, I, 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 absolutely. And at, at, Number, I think he was five in this draft. I, th- I think that was, I think that was the the right call. I'd say the one guy I had rated ahead of him was Whitmore, actually, <laughs> who, who fell because of injury 20. concerns. Yeah. Um, well, th- and together, you know, before Van Vliet got hurt, 
they were coming off the bench as like a tandem, and it was like a that was Joel was, Cola, man. That was yeah. that was incredible. I want to see I want to see them get back to that because that that was such a ride. It was like a wrestling tag team coming in together and just yeah. messing things up. It was great. Um, let's talk about a couple rookies rapid fire that I don't we haven't talked much about. You know, we've all talked about Hawkes and Lively and all these guys. Mm-hmm. Um, Grady Dick is starting to show some signs of life in Toronto after a first forty games where it's like, is he on the team? Is is it <laughs> is this a is this going to be like a Johnny Davis situation where it's like, <laughs> wait, where did he go? Um, he's got some confidence to him. He moves without the ball really well. He's got a quick release and he's shooting them. He's getting them up. He tries on defense. Like he he's he's a pretty heady defensive player. He's going to get picked on a lot, um, and and that will ultimately be the sort of sink or swim thing for him. But after being invisible for 40 games, he's now a big part of their team. And he's like playing pretty well. And you, when he's on the floor, you feel like, oh, my God, they've been starving for a shooter like this. This is why they picked him. Yeah. Um, how, how optimistic are you about his long-term trajectory? I'm relatively optimistic on him. I mean, I had a lottery grade on him coming in because of the, the shooting piece. And then at his size, I think it... It mitigates a little bit some of the defensive questions, and he wasn't he wasn't like a tragic defensive player at Kansas. I no. mean, he was he was he was okay, and I think he has the ability to be okay enough at the defensive end that you leave him on the floor for his shooting, and and you don't worry about it. The thing I saw from him in summer league that uh, I didn't really see from him at Kansas was the ability to shoot a little bit more his jumper off different platforms because his like just standing still catch and shoot, right. It is butter. And, but it's the motions a little bit hard to get into. I think uh, coming, coming off a dribble or catching on the move. And that's where I think he's improved a lot is, is being able to get into that quickly when he, when he, when he's taking a bounce or when he's not completely set. And so I'm excited to see more of that. And he's definitely made a lot of progress as the year goes on. I mean, you mentioned he wasn't playing. He was playing in the G League and he sucked. Okay. So like he's he's come up a long way from where he was in November. That's interesting. I didn't I didn't look up his G League numbers. I knew he had spent a considerable amount of time with the 905. Are they still called the 905? The Raptors 905? Yes. Uh, Mississauga's own uh 905. Um uh I love the T dot. I haven't been there in a while. I miss it. Um but I he looks confident right now and like in, in he looks almost like sometimes cocky as a shooter which i which i like like he, he's like no i belong here i'm gonna make some shots um what do you think of kula bali in washington so he does one or two quote unquote interesting things every game where you go whoa like he's he right now he is not a good player so uh, but on the other hand you you see the pathway pretty easily right because he the mistakes he's making are the types of kind of young player mistakes that are pretty easy to edit out. He'll shoot the ball better than he has this year, but the shot is not broken. Uh, no. So you don't. Looks, he's, he actually, th- he's actually thirty six percent from from three as as I look at it. I I'm pretty bullish on him long term, and fr- from where he was coming from, I mean, he was playing in the. Not even in the main French league, the Espoirs league, which is like the, you know, almost like a U19 league um, in, in France up until the middle of last season. And then he was Wembenyama's teammate and they kind of brought him up to the varsity and he almost immediately made an impact there again with just crazy energy, athleticism and sort of just enough shot making around it. And I think that's the formula for him again in Washington where you're probably going to see it from him on the defensive end before you see it from him on the offensive end. But I, I'm still bullish on him being something and we'll see exactly what that, what that something is. But I think by next year he could be like right now he's playing in the rotation because he, you know, the it's the wizards and they're quote unquote tanking or whatever. And they kind of have to, I think but, I could get removed the quote marks on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think <laughs> I've, yeah, I, you know, I want to do the old, you know, every team's like, Oh, come on. We're out here to compete and we're, you know, whatever. Um, But I think by next year at this time when we're talking, I'd be surprised if he wasn't like legitimately belonging in the rotation. 
I like him. I totally agree. Defensively, he's ready now to guard almost every position on the floor, and they throw him and they do tough, yeah, tough assignments. And he holds his own. He's got long arms. He's tough. He has a good nose for the ball. Um, you know, he offensively, like you said, the jumper, it's it's gonna be one of those things where like the jumper looks fine, it's going in at a decent rate, and teams are just letting him shoot. Still, some teams even put their centers on him, as you see more and more teams do this to, with alleged non-shooting wings and yeah maybe he has to figure out a way around that strategy but i i'm i think i love him as a role player going forward and by the way we should just mention he's not a rookie something's going on with denny abdia who has just exploded in the last four games i was going to mention him and i didn't know if that was like too niche for (laughs) for a national podcast (laughs) this is not niche uh it's denny abdia is averaging 27 a game in his last it's four games on 40 of 65 from the floor. Like what? That's like Shaq would shoot 40 of 65 and Shaq didn't take threes. And look, the Wizards are mostly losing. He he gets to do whatever he wants, which is but he's always been a smart secondary playmaker, a tough defender who takes pride in his defense, a decent to very good passer, but mostly as a secondary ball handler. What's been missing are two things that have come into form for him in the last two weeks, month. It's actually been longer that he's that he's shown some of this. He he has gone through phases of his career where he's been unwilling to shoot enough threes, where he loses confidence and you can you see him catch and not shoot his way out of threes. Yeah. He's letting it fly now. And the second thing is when he gets a smaller defender on him, and this is most visible in transition, he has reached a point of confidence and physicality where he's like, I'm just plowing through this dude and getting to the rim. And that's the kind of thing where you see develop over time. You're like, all right, he's figured something out about how and when to do this. I've always loved his feel for the game, his unselfishness and his defense. If, if this is like semi real, this dude is like a plus starter in the NBA at multiple positions. Yes. And so the thing you look at and say, okay, maybe that's a fluke. Maybe he's not really a 40% three-point shooter, okay, and that's fine. But he's shooting 57% on twos, to your point. I mean, he just he gets guys in the lane and just overpowers them time, time after time. And even in, you know, Atlanta had this game against Washington at home where they got blown out by the Wizards and one of the things the coaches were talking about was we like we just couldn't handle Denny Avdia like once he got in lane got his shoulder on us we were we were just we were just helpless and and you want to say but like come on you can't lose to the Wizards but but it, it that that point was actually true I mean we've seen it do it time and time again to all these opponents now uh over the, especially as you say over the last month or two all right let's get to the headliner and then we'll get you out of here rookie of the year can't remember a rookie of the year race quite like this between two guys whose teams are going to be separated by this much in the standings. And if Victor Wembanyama wins, it will. I, I'm willing to bet it would be the biggest win gap between number one and number two, the biggest negative win gap between number one and number two in rookie of the year voting, maybe ever, because the Spurs mm-hmm. have a very bad record. Um but Victor Wembanyama has has all the advantages in the counting stats. I think he's a a, a slight level above. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. both are pretty goddamn defensively, uh, and his shooting efficiency is ticking up now that he plays center. Um, and obviously the ten block game, the ten block triple double against the Raptors was just like a big flash bulb, like headliner moment for him. Who would you? I was I was Chet 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 all for the first thirty games pretty solidly because. You know, look, I understand Chet's playing with maybe the favorite for MVP right now and a whole bunch of other good good to great players. Jalen Williams is a freaking star right now. Mm-hmm. He's a star, and he looks like he's going to be a superstar. Um, and boy, what a wonder, wonderful context to play. And like, Kaysen Wallace comes in, he's really good. Like, they just are loaded with talent. Victor's playing on a kind of a mishmash team. It's, it's, it's beyond apples to oranges. I think Victor has closed the efficiency gap and done enough defensively in terms of his versatility that I, I think right now it would actually lean Wembenyama, despite the fact that I, I do value, like, do your games actually matter or not? Like, are there stakes to your games? Cause there are games with stakes that feel different than games with no stakes. And there are stakes every night for the thunder who are competing for the number one seed in the championship. Let's face it. 
But man, Wemby is Wemby's doing some stuff. Who would you vote for right now if you had a vote? So I was I was favoring Chet up until about January. And now I think like when you look back at the 2024 season, like it's about Wemby, right? <laughs> like, I'm sorry, it is. And like that, that's that's the guy from this year. Uh and I think what's impressive with Wemby Yama is that he's put up these numbers in spite of the fact that the Spurs spent half the season playing lineups that were seemingly designed to sabotage his output, right? Like in terms of playing Sohan at, at point guard, like, Hey, we're going to let Zach Collins cook from the high post while you're on the court with him. And, you know, we're not going to have any spacing around you at all. And, and he still was able to kind of function in that. And even though he was a pretty, low efficiency of player in that environment. And then we've seen him take off as, as the, as the Spurs have gotten more realistic about what actually works and played him at the five and played Trey Jones at, at point guard and gotten Sohan off the ball. And we've seen him just erupt since then. And then subjectively, I think there is a level of terrifying around the rim that we see with Wembenyama that we don't see uh, with Chet, even though Chet gets some of these shots, like you see guys like go into his body and finish. You do, like you don't see that with Wembenyama. Now, guys have been going at Wembenyama recently and taking, I, I think, some pride in doing it. Zion went at him. Ingram went at him. I can't remember who I was watching them play recently. It was like these guys were making a point to go at him. And some people body him and finish over him. But I agree the terror factor is just different um, with his length. And, and Chet is... Chet is probably a sort of more stable, calm, reliable rim protector in a traditional sense. But Wembenyama is just everywhere all at once. Um, offensively, like he's averaging 21 points a game on 47% shooting, 32% from three, um, which is obviously Chet's at 54% overall, 39% from three. But he's, I think Wemby's a better passer than Chet now. And actually, that's been one of the one of the happy sort of semi-surprises of how, how quickly he's become a really good passer. Sometimes it's like, is he the best passer on the floor for the Spurs? And yeah. Some of the, cause some of those looks he makes you right. And the processing that had to happen for those looks, it's like, Whoa, like yeah. what, what, what was that? Run that by me again. He's throwing passes from the post when he has his back to the basket, uh, from, from out of the pick and roll when help is coming He's throwing passes that are ahead of the rotations that suggests that he has the floor mapped in his head and knows who's going to be where and when, and he throws ahead uh, of the rotations. And now the Spurs, is with Trey Jones and Blake Wesley, has been playing pretty well for them. They have more competent passing around him and more guys who have realized, like, all we got to do is throw the ball up to this dude, like, and he's going to get... There was a play... Who the hell were they playing recently? That was Dallas. They got smoked by Dallas, who looks pretty good um where i don't remember who had the ball um there was just like a scrum of guys around the rim after a pick and roll with one and and someone threw the lob to him late and it was not a great lob and there was like seven guys around the i'm exaggerating but there's a lot of guys around yeah. the basket and all of a sudden and the lob was so weirdly timed that defenders and offense players had jumped and were coming down on their jumps and you're like who's gonna catch this lob and all of a sudden just like an arm emerged from the crowd <laughs> and just tipped the ball in the back. It wasn't, it just tipped yeah. it right in the basket. There was yeah. another one where Blake Les, it was a Blake Wesley Wembenyama pick and roll where Wesley Steve Nashed it. Like he went under the basket and around the other side. And the Mavs were kind of like in between switching and recovering between Wesley's guy and Wembenyama's guy. And Wesley without a second thought was like, I'll just throw let me, What happens if I just throw the ball at the rim and Wembenyama yeah. caught it and dunked it. I was like, Oh, they're starting to figure things out. Underrated thing about him, 81% at the line. Like that, as we've seen with Embiid, like a big man who's gonna a big man who's gonna get fouled a lot and shoot free yeah. throws like that. That's a big deal. Yep. And he does draw a lot of fouls and draws a fair number of uh, this happened a lot in France. We've seen it some in in uh San Antonio too. He draws a lot of landing zone fouls. Like a guy's just like they try to get you know to contest his shot at all. You you have to be so on top of him that you're going to end up fouling him on the contest sometimes. And, and he gets fouled in other ways, obviously, just because he creates so many advantages. Uh, the, and the thing that stands out is like, it's not just chucking to put up numbers anymore, like 60% true shooting since the beginning of January 
on a still massive usage rate. Uh, I think it's over 35 in, in that span. So, and the per game averages almost don't do it justice because they've actually cut back on his minutes a little bit. He has to problem solve a lot too. Like you see teams will throw their centers on Sohan and dare him to shoot and put kind of quick power forwards on Wembenyama like the Mavs did this with PJ Washington and say to him, well, we're going to put a speed, an equal in terms of speed on you. So you're not just going to be able to go around guys. Like you can go around centers. Yeah. Let's see if you can score with your back to the basket. Let's see if you can shoot over this guy. And more and more, he looks comfortable kind of working his way to like a jump hook in the post or he, his face up game is so creative that he can beat some of those guys off the dribble. Honestly, like to me, he looks, everybody watches these games and you're just like, holy, holy, what is this? Like, you know, to me, the the biggest what is this moment where it just jumps out how gigantic he is, is just when he's bringing the ball up the floor because you're like, that, the guy dribbling is that tall and like the ball has to go that far up and yeah. down. He looks and it's, crazy and it's fluid, bringing the ball right? Because he'll bring it up and then like he'll go bat bat between his legs and you're like, wait, wait, I'm sorry, bro. run that back. Now, none of this is to say that I have like decided who I would vote for or that a vote for Chet is crazy because if you value winning and the guy's efficiency is off the charts, his defense is off the charts for a rookie. Um, I, he's been outstanding. Like I have no, his, his off the dribble game. I actually think when Benyama at the start of the season, I thought Chet's off the dribble pump and go game was a little tighter than when Benyama's when Benyama's handle was a little high risk. I think Wemby has closed that gap in terms of dribble reliability, but Chet is super advanced in that regard, by the way, I like the Biombo signing for them. I think I think that like everyone wanted them to get a big a big rebounder guy, and they didn't do it yeah. via trade. I actually think that's a nice flyer for the Thunder. They definitely needed another big. I th I think their their second unit was really starting to show cracks, especially in the front court. And if anything happens to Chet, I think they're in a pretty dire situation there. So I I do think the front court needed addressing. Probably needs more addressing after the season, but yeah, at a bare minimum, like Biombo gave the Grizzlies good minutes when he was there. Uh, he's not going to catch anything, but that's like, they don't really need him to do that. They kind of need functional defense, somebody, anybody who can get a rebound, you know, there is a positive. So I, I, I agree with you. I think that was a really good, like in terms of the scrap heap options that were available, that was definitely the guy for them to get. I do think, and I've said this before, that all the clamoring for they got to get a big, a traditional big to play a decent amount alongside Holmgren. Like, you know, people mentioned Capella as, as sort of an archetype, potentially available guy they could get. I think, I think a lot of those people suggesting that, and it's not a bad suggestion by any means. I do think they underestimate how big of a deal it is for Shea, especially that they play with this five out spacing yeah. all the time. Like the whole reason everyone's like in love with Dagnalt's guard, guard pick and rolls. Like how, how did he figure this out? What a hack to have like mm -hmm. Shay, Isaiah, Joe pick and rolls or whoever, any yeah. combination of any of them, they all work because there's nobody in the lane because Chet Holmgren is a shooting five. I think that would have been a very difficult adjustment two thirds of the way through the season. So I like how they kind of went, half in both directions by getting a player in Hayward who if if and when he's healthy fits exactly what they need on the perimeter and can close some games for them and say okay who's available like we're facing a team where we just need someone to hit people and get rebounds without overexpending assets oh Biombo yeah. let's get him I kind of like how they split the baby that way yeah I think longer term the bigger need for them is somebody in that like six eight six nine size area you know like the Morris twins from five years ago like somebody who can, who is big enough to maybe cross match with Chet and take a five, but plays plays not as a five. If you, if you get my drift, and I so they can keep they can keep that five out, but be a little bigger, a little more solid on the boards. And Brandon Miller, to be clear, is third. Is he just no? He's no brainer third on Rookie of the Year ballots at this point, right? That was Hawkes for a while, and then I think Hawkes's injury. And this time, I think yeah, Miller he's, is, Miller he's is been injured him. and he's fallen off a little. So, yeah, I would I would say Miller is number three right now. All right. John Hollinger, uh, 
every week you have a, a huge column at the athletic. One of the features of it is rookie of the week. And it's one of my favorites because you'll dive deep into someone who really like no one is dove that deep into. And it's always illuminating. Got prospect of the week in there. And anytime there's big news, you're going to write on it. You are on the Hollinger Dun Duncan podcast with our buddy Nate Duncan every Friday. I feel like that comes out Fridays. My it, podcast it, 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 variable. You should, we usually record on Wednesday, so it usually pops in Wednesday night or Thursday morning. Okay. My podcast cadence is all. I, I just see them when I see them. Um, <laughs> I see them when I get my lazy fat ass off to the Peloton. I'm like, all right, what am I going to listen to today? Uh, but just, I always say, the best to ever do it. Uh, enjoy All Star Break. Thank you. Um, hopefully, I run into you at a game soon. John Hollinger, everybody, thanks for your time.